Hey everybody, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Um, my name's Mike Green from Simsy. Uh, I'm on the uh, FM Growth Committee. Uh, I've been for the last eight or seven, seven or eight years. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Prudence, the chairman, couldn't be here this evening. Uh, there is an award ceremony on in London uh, for the FM industry, and um, we, um, we we clashed with them. And surprisingly enough, some of them went to the award ceremony. Um, Without further ado, the first thing I'm going to do is about fire drill. Uh, there are two fire exits, the front door that you all came in, and there is a door around to the side there, with a green fire exit sign on it. Alleyway leads straight out to this street there, so whichever way you'll meet to escape is, those are the two routes. That's my air homestead impression. Um, I'd like to thank CMD, first of all, for allowing us to use this venue. Um, it's a lovely venue, very interesting. They've got some great products in here. Spend a bit of time having a little look around. Um, and there are some guys here from CMD on hand if you've got any questions. Um, I'd also like to thank Wayne Connors and ACCL. As you can see, they, they've sponsored the evening, and their guest speaker works very closely with them. Um, I'm going to very briefly then hand over to Wayne, um, who will tell you all about the evening. He'll introduce his guest speaker, Paul Cave. Uh, I have one other announcement. Um, Sipsy FM Group have another um, seminar on the 8th of November, which is Legislation and Compliance Update at Clyde & Co, the legal company. Um, the subject matter sounds a little bit on the dry side, but uh, when I go into it in a bit more detail, which I very well briefly do, uh, it, you'll see that it's going to be quite interesting. Rod Hunt of Clyde & Co will talk about corporate manslaughter. Something that gets everybody's um, <laughs> uh, Joe Harris will be uh, from Bisria and on the City Committee will be providing uh, uh, an update on building services compliance. And then Steve Hunter will be talking about uh, competency guides in hard FM. And this will all be around the legal side of, of what we of what we should be doing, what we must do. Uh, the pitfalls of uh, when we don't do things, etc., etc. So that's the 8th of November at Clyde & Co. in the city. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Well, good evening, everybody. My name's Wayne Connors, and I'm the Managing Director of Active Communications, Company Limited. And I have the pleasure of hosting tonight's event. We were going to use the mic, but I don't think we need it now. Um, I'd like to thank Paul uh, Cave who's going to be helping me with the pre technical presentation for tonight. I'd also like to thank um, Sibsley for organising the event and also again CMB for allowing us to use the presentation suite. So tonight's topic is power over Ethernet. So what is power over Ethernet? Ethernet cables are traditionally used for the transmission of data services. Power over Ethernet is the electrical transmission of current over a twisted pair cable. Therefore, we can simultaneously power a data device. These devices include such things as computers, Wi-Fi points, CCTV, and access control. This immediately offers multiple benefits to the end users. Firstly, we install less cables, reducing cable clutter. From a design point of view, POE is excellent. Because it allows greater flexibility in the workplace, hard to reach data devices can now be fed easily. Typically, these would be something like a Wi Fi point in the ceiling. Another advantage of POE is it's more energy efficient compared to traditional cabling installations. Paul will explore this topic in more depth in his presentation. So what is the size of the PIE market today? The number of PIE ports being employed is significantly increasing. The latest business report in 2015 stated that 80% of voice over IP, 20% of Wi-Fi access points, and 30% of CCTV cameras now are running over PIE. A very recent article stated that the Ethernet is expected to grow globally by around about 12.5% between 2015 and 2020, resulting in a rise of 451 million devices in 2016 
to 1.48 billion devices in 2020. The majority of organisations have old cabling systems that weren't designed with PoE in mind. I'd like to share with you a video of a recent project we did at Southampton Football Club, where the existing network wasn't designed with PoE in mind. The reason why they uh, upgraded to a PoE environment is because they wanted to deploy a new white, uh, VoIP telephone system on Wi-Fi throughout the stadium. The existing system had to be completely um, modified. This is an extreme example of a company's infrastructure that wasn't designed with PoE in mind. Brace yourselves. Also, potential problems with new cabling installations as more and more power is being delivered to the end device. These cables are now carrying increased current, therefore, more heat is being generated, and this needs to be taken into consideration when designing any new structured cabling installation. I now like to pass you over to Paul and thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Good evening. Good evening, um, my name is Paul Cave, I'm the Technical Product Manager and I've spoken on this subject a number of times based upon the research we've done over the years. Um, I'm going to share some of those findings with you. As Wayne has alluded, there's some great benefits for remote powering. That's what we should really be talking about now. Um, provide a great deal of power saving. There was a survey done in the US about three years ago which looked at approximately 100 million deployed POE devices. And somebody did a calculation based on the fact that the typical power draw of these devices is about 8 watts. It's much more efficient to deliver DC than it is AC and convert it at the device. So that 8 watts equated to 60.8 million kilowatt hours. 
of energy savings per year by using POE devices. That's what's driving all of this very much in the marketplace. Sorry, it's a bit slow. Uh, not only the power savings, it's the flexibility um, that it gives you. No more power bricks, no more carrying around these power bricks. I would use my laptop here today and I'd have to have a power brick with me. We're going to move forward shortly to see devices where you don't need these bricks anymore. It's purely POE driven. There are a couple of other standards to consider in the building service arena. Within the cabling industry, we've developed two standards over the last couple of years. There's the Senelec standard, which is 5173 part six, distributed building services. And then there's the ISO version, exactly the same content, but it's the international version, also looking at distributed building services. This, these two standards have been developed to allow you to use the structured cabling as your um, transport media for all your building services devices. So why is it good news? Well, reality, what we've always been wanting to do, and I spoke about this, yeah, I've been in the industry long enough, about 20 years ago, to talk about structured cabling should be viewed as the fourth utility in the building. So we have the electric, the gas, the water, and the structured cabling as the utilities, as part of the fabric of the building. So why not use it more effectively? A couple of fundamentals with PoE. So we're all on the same page in hymn sheets as far as this is concerned. PoE is an application in the same way as 100 base T or 1 gigabit Ethernet. It is not special. You don't need any special requirements to run over it because it's designed to run over standard compliant product. So you don't need special cables. That's the principle of PoE. There are two forms as we know them at the moment. There's PoE, which is 802.3 AF. It's 15.4 watt powering, 12.95 watts at the end device. The Wi-Fi access point, the camera, etc., etc. There is a difference between what is sent and what is received. And that's lost in transmission, effectively. But I'll come back to explore that a little bit more in a moment. The intelligence with PoE is all with the end device. It is not the switch that's delivering the power. It's not what's being pushed out is the intelligence. It's the end device. There's a, like a wake-up call and negotiation goes on, and the end device says, I want this much power. I want it over these two pairs of wires, and I want this class of current as well. We upgraded this in 2009 to produce 802.3 AT which is PoE plus. So we have a thing, 34.4, 34.2 watts powering, 25.5 watts powered. Yeah. Again, it is still two pair powering. So two of the four pairs are used to deliver the power. And it is that end device which dictates on which two pairs it wants on. There is work currently underway with another group within the IEEE called 802.3 BT. Now, they caused quite a bit of a stir with what they're doing. They started work late 2013, and they continue on with work. It's expected that it's probably going to be sometime in 2017 by the time that this comes out. They're asking for a minimum of 49 watts powered, and potentially up to 100 watts for things like LED lighting. I'll come back to that one later. Um, there is also a technology on the marketplace from our good friends at Cisco called UPOE or Universal POE. It's exactly the same as 802.3 AT, but it's now delivering the power over four pairs. So it's doubling up by delivering on four pairs rather than the two. I'll skip through that one very clearly. It's just a definition about where it delivers the power it says it must be over it goes back to this thing about nothing special 
as you can see on the top there, type two, which is this 802.3 AT operation, requires a class D or a carry 5E cable or better. That's all it says. Doesn't need any more than that. There is a side uh, thing which says a DC loop resistance of 25 ohms or less. Well, quite frankly, in today's market, that's easy. All cables will hit 25 ohms or less. Now, Cisco's UPoE, it's been around for quite some time. But the one key thing with that is they recommend the highest possible category of cable that you can get to carry it. The thicker the conductor, the better. The reason for this is quite simple, it's just about the electrics. The power goes down the center of the core of the conductor, the communication signal gets transmitted down the surface of the conductor. So that's how we're doing it, in simplest terms. But we did Genting Casinos. Um, it always makes me smile. It's a place called NEC Resort World. How you can have an NEC resort, a resort at the NEC in Birmingham is beyond me. But <laughs> They've got one, the Genting Casino. Uh, we did work on that one about two years ago. There's got a lot of Cisco's UPOE, and they insisted on carrying six A or above cables being installed to support their technology. Now, there is another technology on the marketplace called HD Base T. Be very wary of this one because it's not what it says on the surface. It's 100 watts, four pair powering. But it is a HD AV application. It's intended for 4K video streaming. It's not intended for data transmission. In fact, it will only support 100 megabit Ethernet. And not that many people with their corporate backbones running at those speeds. There's limits on distances and size as well. Right. With all of this, there's no gain without pain. And there's a number of electricians in the room that know this, electrical engineers. You don't lose energy, it just gets converted into another form of energy. So this power that we're losing is actually being converted into heat. Now, um, I have to change the wording on that one. I gave this presentation in the States and I said early research had a flawed testing methodology and two people in the back of the room panicked because they started to think about phoning up their lawyers because it's a very litigious and if you say it's flawed what they've done, yeah, they start panicking. Anyway, it's limited what they did. Basically, this was the early research that I saw IEC did where they got bundles of cables they created this bundle in a room similar to this, free air ventilation. They energized it with up to 600 milliamps per pair, and then they tested the heat increase. The problem was they then went on to make a number of assumptions because they only tested the CAT6 cable of 23AWG and they made assumptions about what would happen to a CAT5E cable or a CAT6A cable. They didn't take certain other parameters into, um, into mind. They didn't also think about other places which, where you might see these cables installed. On the raised floor, for example, above fault ceilings. So, we in Senelec uh, thought, right, we need to change some of this. We need to have all these bundles of cables and change it to look at two things. One, ventilated or insulated spaces as well as free air. At the same time we wanted to look at the DC resistance of the cables and look at not the categories but the conductor sizes because the conductor sizes would impact upon the heating factor. So we did all of that. We considered all of those and we produced our own technical report called 50174-99-1. We create a very simple test model, and we also looked to a couple of other factors that we had concerns about 
which the early research hadn't considered. And we looked at all of these things. Um, we wanted to see whether there was going to be any impact on the channel performance as this temperature went up, etc., etc. Was there going to be damage on the mating of contacts as you were plugging devices in and out? What would happen there? All of these factors had to be taken in. Now, we commissioned some research with some clever people up at the Montford University in Leicester. Um, and we brought it out, um, put this test model into place. Basically, it was 100 metres of cable round a rig, it was about 2.1 metres long, and it ended up with a 37 cable bundle. You then used a number of thermocouples to validate the temperature at the centre of the bundle, next layer out, next layer out. 37 cables actually gives you a perfect round four layer bundle. And that's why we used it. Also doing this test was one of our uh, competitors, was a company called Comsco, a guy called Arne Keller did the research in Sweden. And we shared all the results with Tenlife to see what the impact was. What we wanted to do was look at a mitigation report to find out what the impact of things like this would have on the performance of the cable and on the lifespan of the cable. The one thing we did that was different to most is we explored it with seven different cable types. We even got a rogue box of Cadbury 6 copper clad aluminium, which is absolutely no known in the industry, and tested that out to see what would happen. We took, to prove the point about conductor size, we used a reduced diameter Cadbury 6 um, on screen cable from one of our competitors. A standard Cat 5E cable, a standard size Cat 6 UUTP, Cat 6A FFTP, Cat 6 FTP, and Cat 7A SFTP. The differences between these two is that one's got a 23 AWG, that one's got a larger 22 AWG conductor. We applied everything from 34.2 to 60 watts to 100 watts over this and measured the temperature increase. Now, the one thing this chart doesn't show you is the time it takes to get to a steady state. It does take, in some cases, quite some time to get to these steady states. Uh, like in the case of the CAT6, to get to that steady state, it took about 800 minutes to get to that point of being steady. But as you can see here, we see temperature ranges of anything up to 46 degrees C above ambient. Now the ambient in the room at the time was measured at 22, uh, 22 degrees. So all of a sudden we're getting up to 68 degrees in the cable bundle. And the words point. But that is all pairs energized free air. Yeah? It gets better when you put it in insulation. It gets a lot better. We saw Cat 5E, Cat 6 reduced diameter, hitting temperatures of 118 degrees C above ambient before they fail. They fail not because they're a fire hazard or anything like that, but you're getting up to the temperatures that you use to extrude those polymers onto the conductors themselves. So they start to recrystallize, go soft, and the conductors migrate to the surface and short out. So you just short the power supply. So they become a natural fuse. Now, we did all of this to prove the extremes and to also prove the model that larger diameter cables, not just larger conductors, but larger diameter cables and larger conductors perform better in the heating factor. Interestingly, this first four, up to calorie six copper clad aluminium, all failed. They fused out. These three carried on working. In fact, on the Cat 7A, we ramped the, um, the wattage up to 120 watts, and it still wouldn't fail. So there is proof in all of that work. So. It gives us the start of some mitigation strategies, which I'm now going to start to discuss with you. 
But why is it important that we mitigate and keep these temperatures low? All cabling is designed to operate at an ambient temperature of 20 degrees C. That's what all the measurements are based upon. So if you talk about a 90 metre permanent link or a 100 metre channel, it's all based on it working at 20 degrees C. If we then start raising the temperature above 20 degrees C, we have to then derate the transmission distance. Now, there's two different calculations here. I won't read them out, but it's different from screening than it is screened. The impact of this, and this is taken from the standard, is that 90 meter permanent link that you've installed and you're going to operate with a camera, if you hit 60 degrees C, your transmission distance will really only be 76 meters. So when you've planned this all out and designed it all out and you put your camera 90 meters away from your switch and you're expecting it to work, but then you power up loads of POE and you raise the temperature and then you wonder why it stops working. And it's purely because of that derating factor based upon temperature. The increase in resistance is directly related to the temperature. We also looked at a couple of other factors within this, but what it did clearly prove was larger conductors, larger size cables perform a lot better. Uh, and the other thing is, please, copper clad aluminium, well, it's not allowed in our industry, that's quite clear, but it should be out of, although we got a box of it from Amazon. We went online on Amazon, found a box. <laughs> that's how we got it. Not there at all. There is also another implication within all of this. If you look at all the cabling manufacturers and system manufacturers, their manufacturers' T's and C's clearly state that the warranty is based upon the cables, that cabling system being used in compliance with ISO 11801. ISO 11801 says the upper temperature limit or the temperature variance is minus 10 to plus 60. So if we go above it, could be all bets off. Now, summary so far, insulated or ventilated space for worse, conductor sizes, cable size, screen cables are better, loose laying cable is beneficial, rather than having these nice neat bundles of 24 cables. But, what we've been able to do now is come up with a spreadsheet modeling calculation. I'll show you a bit of it in a moment. That allows you to calculate beforehand what the actual temperature is going to be. One of the other factors, that it looked at is having gaps and separations between bundles of cables and separations between individual. If you've got, say, 100 cables going down a route, don't energize all 100 cables. Just only have some of them carrying POE, some not, and you get better. Uh, heating characteristics or thermal characteristics. Careful planning using this modeling calculations is strongly recommended. You do have to know a bit about maths to get away with it, though. And I'm not to I'm not your best on this. But before I get on to that, there are a couple of other bodies researching this at the moment. In the States, there is a group called the SPI. Uh, it's a specialist plastics industry. The people like the Dow Chemicals, DuPont, so this world, Chemos, who make all the polymers that you put onto cables. They're interested to see what this happens to make sure there's no artificial aging. Uh, any impacts on that? Um, they scared the NFPA and the, NS, uh, the NEC, which is the National Electrical Code in, in the States, to react to this, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. But there is other things that will put your mind at rest on in a moment. One of the other further bits of research that we wanted to do, and we carried on with, was to look at artificial aging. As you saw right at the beginning, there were some concerns about things like ACR and PSACR, 
how you use um, being damaged. The one we saw, saw the most of, and what I am most concerned about, the return loss reports, which is one of the two key factors that we look at for good in cabling installations. So we commissioned some additional work at the Montfort. We created a heat chamber. We put 50 meters of cable inside it. We terminated both ends. Rigged it up to a pair of uh, fluke field testers and a laptop that was next to it. Uh, one of the good guys at Fluke, James Woody, wrote a nice little routine that rather than somebody stood there pressing a the button every five minutes to test it, the, the laptop did it automatically for you and we recorded all the results. So we did all of this in 10 degrees increments and we wanted to do numerous test cycles to see what the impact was going to be over a period of time. Because the one key factor within this is all these devices we're talking about. If you've got a CCTV camera and there's nobody walking around in front of it, it's going to drop down into a standby mode. It's going to be waiting for something to happen, so it will use far less power. While the access point, if there's no conversation going on, it'll go into standby mode and wait for something to come on. So the power levels will be constantly going up and down. So that heating cycle may be a factor. However, you can concern uh, between B1 and B2, baseline 1 and B, baseline 2, see all these nice colour graphs. If you look here, there are some significant changes, and it's the same cable, but the values from before the test, which took this sort of two, 2,000 minutes, 33 hours of testing to achieve, we did change the value of the cable. Better value of that one. But the one good bit of news is we pre cooked it. That's effectively what we did. The cable only changed after the first cycle. No matter how many other cycles we did after that, the values and the performance of the cable stayed exactly the same. And we were doing this between uh, 0 and 60 degrees C. So you can see that this. Uh, the blue is after the first cycle, the ready ground is all the others, and as you can see there, it's done 19 cycles at one time, and after, there's no change in the values. That's another way of looking at it. We did, uh, we did a bit something crazy, we, went, we took it up to 120 degrees C to see what would happen on there, and it does affect it. But you see, these are values where we just did it on that one, two, minus, uh, sorry, ambient to 60 degrees a number of times and just stayed where it was. Right. There is another piece of standard work that's been done and there's some nice videos on, on YouTube of this incident or this uh, phenomenon. When you plug an RJ45 into an outlet that's when it will start negotiation on the power. Nothing will happen. It's when you demate it, all that 600 milliamp will go over one of the contacts and it will arc across the contact. So when that happens, it starts to erode the gold plating on each one of the contacts. So it can damage a life cycle. Because that outlet and that plug is meant to mate 750 times. So if you're going to damage it, this, it could lead to problems. The good news is the swept point and the contact point, the initial contact point is here, but the full swept contact for the performance is further up of the contact. You never damage where it's going to be fully mated, but it will, it could cause problems over a period of time. But there's a long test for it, uh, just a bit of fun. Basically, at the end of the day, uh, the maximum variance is 20 milliohms variance between the start of the test and the end of the test, after a, about four days of work. Uh, right, one word of advice. It is important to research and understand this. There are standards out there to help you with all of this. Um, and I'll come on to a couple of those now. We'll look at cabling systems that's done this work and have got um, connectors that have been tested 
for that mating and not mating. And integration powers is right away. We will understand that all this is very important. Now, one thing to consider, well, it's slightly off topic, but it's, it's very important. 50173 part six, distributed building services, is all about how you're going to use this to support other IP enabled devices, the increasing number of them. And this is an increasing part of the marketplace. We've got some similar terms to what we have in structured cabling, but now we're calling service concentration points, service distributors, service outlets, rather than telecoms outlets and the broad distributors that we've been using before. Some of the key differences within this, there's a very nice part of it, which now looks at we've got campus distributed, building industry, service distributed, service concentration points. But the one big one now is you are allowed with this, it's not frowned on anymore, to directly connect your horizontal cabling into your end device. So if you've got the right field terminatable RJ45 plug, you can put that onto the horizontal cable that directly into your camera or your Wi-Fi point. You don't have to have an outlet and a patch lead going between, which was always a restriction previously. There is another area within this type B, which comes up to the service concentration point. We also now allow to get a network conversion interface. So you can go all the way out to like uh, a DALI controller, a BMS controller that then has subcontrollers on it. And then you can go out to the traditional way of doing it, whether it's star, bus, loop, tree and branch, whichever way the technology used to be for the building search, you can now use that by connecting at that network interface. It also gives us the opportunity to plug the POE source in at that network conversion point, so you don't have that heating effect over the whole bulk of the field. So that's just the service area guidelines of what's allowed to do. Now the good news. I'll give you some good news. It's about to give you all the warnings and that. Higher power is coming. Whether we like it or not, this is coming. It's going to happen. Integrating structured cabling as part of the fabric of the building is now increasingly common. More and more projects we'll see it going that way. Building service lands are becoming common. One way of mitigating against the implications of higher power is by using these building service standards and having the right integrator. Now, furthermore, a development that's come along, and it will come along to all of you as well, but it's a new standard we're going to have to start thinking about. In 2019, we will see 62368 come into full force. And that's all about the safety of audiovisual equipment and information technology equipment. And part three of it is all about the safety of those devices that you plug into an IT network that you're going to remote power. So what we're saying in the cabling standards is plug these devices in at the end and you're going to be fine. It's not going to be a problem. That's what you've got to be starting to look for. I talked about that modeling calculation, and a good friend of mine, Mike Gilmore, sat this committee. He calculated this for a recent meeting. Now, what he was looking at is a 20 degree rise in the surface of a bundle of cable. And he calculated, based on insulation conditions, ventilator and conduit, how many cables it would take to get up to this 20 degrees. Energized cables. The interesting one is 19.3 in conduit. That's one big bit of conduit because it'll take 168 cables. In a ventilated trainwork, it'll th take 312 cables to get up to that. And that's based upon the calculations that's given to you in 50174 99 1. So, after giving you all the scare stories of what we did to research this, and what we've now been able to prove in reality is the problem is not as big 
as was first thought. It still can have a factor because a 20 degrees C rise over ambient will still derate your transmission distance, but not by as much as previously thought. Now, see if this one worked. Struggled with me before, but I'll do my best. I don't know how I didn't want to work this one. Um, that was all about the Internet of Things. Looking at all the devices now, we're starting to see plugged in. We're even seeing things like intelligent washing machines. We're all seeing this Nest. We're talking about this, um, this Ring video thing for your home at the moment. All these devices are coming. But the other one is intelligent lighting. Um, I mentioned right at the beginning about this 100 watts for LED lighting. You don't need it. And then what I'm about to show you is going to prove that point. There is a solution on the marketplace that uses standards compliance 822.3 AT, so it's 34.2, uh, 25.5 watts, to power an LED lighting system. And it's much more than just intelligent buildings. It uses POE switch, which connects up to luminaires. Once you have it on a Wi-Fi network, and it's on the same network, you control it by an app on your phone. Because there's a couple of IR readers. There's PIR, and there's an IR reader in the light fitting itself. And it communicates by Wi-Fi, by that IR connection. You just focus the camera on your, on your phone at the light. And then it comes through to whole energy management suite. Now I'm going to try and show this video, but this will crash and I'll have to go back out the other way and do it. So, bear with me. This is Deloitte's building in Amsterdam. Connected lighting system with over 6,000 LED luminaires. The connected lighting system uses the building's lighting infrastructure for more than just illumination. Every second luminaire is equipped with a multi-sensor that measures movement, light, temperature, and infrared. Each luminaire is uniquely identified and seamlessly integrated into the IT network of the building. The connected lighting system offers exciting new opportunities to different users of the building. Comprehensive data is gathered and processed by Deloitte Data Analytics. This information is presented to the facility manager on a dashboard, which provides access to real-time and historical information about the building's usage, enabling this person to precisely monitor and manage every facet of the edge. When an office floor is empty, all lights are automatically switched off, and ventilation is set to a minimum. As soon as someone arrives in an office space, the connected lighting system provides 300 lux illumination and adjusts the ventilation to the desired level. Employees can also act as owners and operators of the space. With a smartphone or tablet, they can set the temperature and lighting to support their individual preferences. The app also enables them to view and monitor their sustainable behavior. One can all... Thank you. Yeah, so. so, thank you very much indeed. The one thing that that system also does, if you noticed very quickly, it's a cleaning schedule. What it also helps you to do, it monitors the usage and occupancy of rooms. And if somebody hasn't been in a room all day, it doesn't get cleaned. It just gets left. So they take it off the cleaning schedule. So it's very environmentally friendly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? I uh, just got a question for you about that last building. Um, it's called the Edge in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. It's the greenest building in probably the world. Um, what exactly is powering the LED? I understand what's going on behind in terms of data and intelligence. But is, is the suggestion that every one of those LEDs is actually powered off POE? Yes, that's true. So, how many watts in total is being handled by POE in that building? Each one of those switches 
It's an eight port switch, can deliver 30 watts. Over the eight ports? Over the, no, 30 watts per, per port. Per port. Oh, okay. So, and each one of those LED luminaires takes 25 watts. So, so how many ports do you need then to support that one switch? Oh, there's, one of the reasons why um, Cisco signed an alliance with Philips Lighting for this is because it uses rather a large number of ports. Uh, yeah. But it does, provide, it does provide a lot more in, it does not provide a lot more than just the lighting. It does everything else about the controls, about the temperature, um, the lighting levels, occupancies, everything else. So essentially that's a concept. It's not a real building. It is a real building. No, no, I know it's a real building, but what I'm saying is in terms of POE, it's really a concept building. I, I'll explain what I mean. Yes, yeah. I went into a supermarket in Switzerland to see the, the first LED, totally LED lit supermarket. Yeah. And I can almost remember the whole lot was standing at the front door, our engineers, and it was just a terrible silence when we all went, oh shit, it actually works. It's real LED it actually can power a supermarket. But then it turned out that actually the cost of the fittings and the power that they consumed um, was actually completely uneconomic. Right. So that wasn't the point. The point was the concept. That yeah. They had they had proved that they could buy a supermarket with LED. Yeah. No one no one believed that was just gonna improve as the years went on. So what I'm saying is that's a concept. We it, it's going a bit more than a concept now, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, when they first came up with that, there was an economics argument against the Philips POE lighting system because it was far more economic to install and run in a relative short period than any lighting system driven by Dow. Yeah. Yeah. On that one, that was based upon the fact that those switches had a, ten, uh, a standby draw of 24 watts. So when it went into standby mode, it was drawing 24 watts. The second generation switches now only draw 4 watts. So the whole economics have been swung round on it. Does it use a dedicated uh, data and POE distribution network just for the lighting, or is it amalgamated with the general lighting of the building? No, it's dedicated purely the lighting for the whole building. So you've, you've got layers of networks around the building? Yes. That's right. It's, it's got a number of other very clever things that it does, um, because it can also, those um, PIR sensors uh, can also work out where the sun is, because it will adjust to the sunlight coming into the room as well. Does a company around here do that? Does a company around here provide lighting solutions like that? Not like Within this area, on the place. Not like I don't know if it's power over Eve now, but they had all the, the it was, uh, controlled all the same way. Everything yes. done through the rack and then all that very yes. kind of sensors. I don't know if it was POE, but I know there was a company. Yeah, no, you can do that. You can do that over a dolly control the lighting system. Daylight thing is very common. Yeah. Everybody does yeah. daylight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you see this yeah. full integrated rack, yeah. some more rack here, we've got one here. Yeah, various, various lighting companies do more than lighting on, on acoustic racks, you know, with multi service. I think you can you can always need to make it rally controllers, but you know, they're operating on the yeah. south. You can actually buy a key dog here so you can see what's going on and interact with them. But that's not that's a different thing. Dollies are actually doing all of the yeah, and the, the problem with Dali is it, it runs at 1,200 volts, so it's very, very slow. So you can mm. put Ethernet behind it, but you're only going to go as fast as Dali can go. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the key issue is, and it was right at the beginning you said, is whether or not uh, the putting in a special circuits for other purposes like lighting, power, etc., whether or not it's putting in the one circuit for Ethernet. So if you could justify enough of that Ethernet connection that possibly that makes sense. The problem is, you know, I was in our, in our office this morning and today and they were saying, oh, the problem is when this Ethernet also powers all your computers. But my comment was actually you won't be using a computer, you probably have a, a tablet talking to your sense that the Ethernet is no longer required at all yeah. because it's actually coming through. So the, the issue of this, I think, is it's, it's horses for courses. Yeah, it has much. very good uses in some buildings where you need high data but it's not, I, my personal view is it does offer 
other complications, mm -hmm. not least install uh, data, uh, prevent the uh, install the data uh, base that can actually install it properly. Because I reckon if you install it badly, you are really. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a danger here as well, um, as you said, possible problems, new buildings, concept design. Yeah. Or, uh, as we all know, that energy reduction. That yeah. The biggest problem there is not in the new buildings. The problem is in the installed base of buildings. Yeah. 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 So. The, the danger here is that coming in with that concept into an existing building, as you pointed out, I think at the very start, somebody pointed out at the very start about how the whole system has to be completely ripped out and redone. It's, it, there's going to be a concept in some clients' minds here that they can just somehow run it magically. Uh, uh, you know, Ripping out the cable and starting again is usually it's one of the barriers to, towards technology upgrades. Always, because people will say, oh right, I want this new technology, I want to go forward with this new technology, and they have to factor in, not just the cost of recapping, it's not that that's the major bugbear, it's the disruption of it. But on the other hand, a, re a rewire of a part or all of the building, it might be more appropriate to do it than these things. Mm. It might be. Because if you're just dealing with the light in that instance, so I come back to it, it's really much horses for courses and yeah. what you expect from that building. What, what Deloitte wanted to do there was manage their facility more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. They, it was a concept building, in fact, that they've got rainwater harvesting. They've got all sorts of different things going on in the building. But at the end of the day, um, they're seeing cost savings. Um, because it's in Holland, the Dutch governments are rewarding them for being green. outside a building, see its chillers very easily, you know, mm -hmm. see the plants in there and then hack in very easily. And it seems like an area which is kind of overlooked in maybe the facility side of automation. It could be a value. I'm not an expert on that one, so I can't really, but it's interesting that it coincides with um, the Chancellor today announcing billions more in um, cyber security. Yeah. It's very interesting presentation was done on this yeah. and included and three quarters of their presentation was about security and using the right ports. I will add no more. Yes, <laughs> yes. it's true. It, it, it is a legacy problem, though. You're absolutely right. I mean, I've come originally from the controls and BMS industry. Um, the, way the, the, the way the bid install was set up, because it's nothing to do with finance or moving money, the, the people that design these systems just believe, well, why would anybody want to hack into it? So you're probably going to be a kid in a bedroom with a bit of knock to the back of the button. <laughs> We're connecting more and more to these systems, and you know, if you, if you suddenly switch the lights off or defeat the security, it then does become serious. So, the people are just waking up to the fact now that we do need to put firewalls on, we do actually need to move away from default passwords. Yeah, what? Security's there, we, it's just not switched on, so to speak. Yeah. And then we'll get to that level, and then somebody will find a way around it, and it'll just keep chasing itself out. But, but uh, I would say we move a lot of um, cyber security work. And, uh, it's nothing we can do with power over Ethernet, it's just doing IP addresses. Yeah, it's stop yeah. and exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. your point. End to end encryption should be standard, isn't, and passwords and all the rest of it. So it's a point, but it doesn't get to being a POE specific. No, it's yeah, it's getting companies to wake up to the fact yeah. that they need to be more secure. I think the BMS industry, for instance, just thought, well, why would anybody want to enter this system? Yeah. Is there, um, I was going to say, is there a second bill? Is there any refer example to, I guess, in London or it's, elsewhere of POE yet? Um, I know well, Philips are working on. A, I know right. Philips are working on a few at the moment, but I can't say where they're at and where they're at that discussion. You know, so I stay. Was it was an earlier paper called Redwood? They did for um, Moffitt's offices about. 
Yeah. They've been folded. Yeah. Well, I got pulled into the into Walmart's and they proudly showed me their system and I know you true that. <laughs> their system it wasn't POE that they were doing, but they were using structured cabling to each cable was taking 20 watts of power and it was just using structured cable to do it. It had a special switch to a special luminaire. And it was like, yeah. And that's why it's failed. Thank you for um, talking, Paul. Uh, and thank pleasure. you, Wayne, for sponsoring the evening. Um, I thought your bit of the film was really interesting. <laughs> I love watching time maps recorded, whatever they're about. Um, and that was brilliant. I love the guy with all the cables around his neck. You know, and, and, and every time, every time you saw him next time, there was a few less cables around his neck. He was getting lighter by the minute. So, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, there's some refreshments and some food next door. Uh, please join us for a glass of wine or a beer and something to eat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.